<clears throat> Good evening. I'm Dina Mansour, Executive Director of the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Center. Welcome to tonight's dialogue, Strategic Empathy, the Key to America's Failed North Korea Policy, featuring Robert McCoy and moderated by Stephen Levine. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening, especially on such a beautiful night, and for submitting some uh, great questions already to our speakers. The Mansfield Center was endowed by an act of Congress in 1983 in honor of the life and legacy of Ambassador Mike, Mike Mansfield and his life partner, Maureen. Um, we, are, we focus on his legacy of statesmanship, of ethics, and of civility in public affairs. We foster globally minded leaders of integrity with a focus on our democratic institutions and global mutual understanding, especially with Asia. I'm honored to introduce our primary speaker this evening, Robert E. McCoy. Bob writes and speaks on geopolitical events and international affairs in East Asia, particularly in North Korea and its relations with other players in the region. During a 20 year career in the US Air Force as an intelligence professional, he lived in East Asia for more than 14 years. Subsequently, he has published over 150 political analyses and commentaries in various journals focusing on Asia. He has been interviewed by American and overseas news outlets for his views on regional affairs, and his analysis on North Korea has been officially cited by foreign governments. I'm also honored to introduce tonight our moderator, Stephen Levine. Steve writes and lectures on Chinese history and politics and on US-China relations. During a 40-year teaching career, he taught at American University, Columbia University, and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as here at the University of Montana. He has written, co-authored, edited, and translated from Chinese and Russian some dozen books in his fields of interest, as well as published scores of journal articles, book chapters, and review essays. He has also been a critical member of the Mansfield Center team, serving as associate director, and currently serving as one of our primary advisors as a Mansfield Senior Fellow on China and East Asia. Steve, thank you so much for moderating tonight's discussion, and I will turn it over to you. Dina, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me add my welcome to all the people who are taking part in this dialogue. Um, let me say that Bob McCoy is actually a friend of mine as well as a colleague. And then much of what I've learned about North Korea is from having hamburgers and fries with him at Glenn's Cafe in Lolo. So I'm now talking from uh, the woods in North Carolina where I am. <clears throat> but I look forward to rejoining the center at some time in person. And let's get started then with what I think should be a very stimulating evening because Bob is really someone who has studied these questions for a long time, thought about them, sometimes in an unorthodox way, which I think it needs to be done very often in international affairs, and has some answers that I think that will be very thought provoking for everyone who was watching this tonight. So let's get started, Bob, if we may, with the question of some background information on North Korea itself. I think many people, including myself actually, who is certainly not as familiar with North Korea as I am with China or Japan, could benefit from maybe five or, five or so minutes of background about the country itself before we get into the politics of the country and Korea, North Korean relations with the United States. Okay. So let's, let me turn it over to you, Bob. Okay, well, thank you very much, Steve. And uh, Dina, thank you for such a wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to do this, uh, particularly with my good friend Steve here. So yes, let us get started. Um, I want to uh, start out by mentioning that uh, North Korea is a very small country. It's about 4,600 or 46,500 square miles, about the state of Montana, uh, uh, sorry, Mississippi. And we're going to, let's see here, I need to back up. We'll start with this slide here to show you the position of uh, North Korea with relation to the United States. Here on the map, you can see the United States. Many of our uh, attendees tonight are in uh, Montana around this area. Of course, they're all over the place. Um, and before I go any further, I'd like to point out that from Seattle to Miami 
is about 3,000 miles. This distance will become uh, significant a little bit later. So we cross the international dateline. Here we are in East Asia, the great land mass of uh, China, East Asia, China there. North Korea is this part of the Korean Peninsula, just north of the South Korea, and here's Japan. We'll zoom in a little bit on another map. Here's a better map of, of Far East Asia today. Uh, Japan here, South Korea, the Republic of Korea, as it's formerly known, ROK. Uh, North Korea, DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea here. And then this is China, sorry. Uh, my finger gets fat sometimes. Uh, here is China, Far East China. And surprisingly, there is a border uh, with Russia. So explaining this a little bit, uh, we have 900 miles of border between North Korea and China along the Yalu River, which flows here, and the Dumen River, which flows there. We have an 11 mile border with Russia, 250 mile border uh, with uh, South Korea, the East Sea, also known as the Sea of Japan by the Japanese, Japan there, the Yellow Sea, and China to the east as well as to the north. So let's zoom in a little bit tighter. And here we have North Korea itself. And at this point, it would be useful to show that here's the 38th parallel running right across the peninsula here. This was the dividing line at the end of, imposed by the United States at the end of World War II. And it stayed in effect for uh, not quite five years when the Korean War broke out. And three years later, when an armistice, not a ceasefire, uh, well, an armistice is a ceasefire, but not a peace treaty was reached. Uh, this is the line right here. It's called the demilitarized zone. It's four kilometers, two and a half miles wide with the military demarcation line running right through the middle along through here. Uh, many journalists use these two pieces, uh, uh, these two lines as being interchangeable. And I wanna make a point that they're certainly not because while this is certainly more a land that South Korea has above the 38th parallel on here, it's mostly mountains and while it's a beautiful country, it really doesn't contribute anything except for a few tourists in this area. What South Korea lost below the DMZ for the, the 38th parallel along here is fantastic agricultural lands, including some wonderful orchards. We also lost the wonderful city of Kaesong. So, Having said that, I want to get into some other aspects of North Korea. Uh, it's 5,000 miles from the west coast of the United States, according to that major map. And I mentioned that to you because I want you to add the 5,000 and the 3,000 together and keep the number 8,000 miles in mind. Uh, that will become a little bit uh, clearer to you as we get into the presentation a little bit. Population of North Korea is about 25 million people half the population of South Korea. Most of it, of course, is in the area of Pyongyang and so forth. The country is not a true communist or socialist uh, country at all. Its government is a feudal type a dictatorship, dynast dynastic. It's the Kim family it has run it for three generations and they run the country strictly for the benefit of the regime. The average uh, individual income in the North is $1,300 per person. That's less than 4% of what the South Korean counterpart average is. Uh, the North Koreans are two inches on average shorter than their South Korean counterparts. They live 11 to 12 years, fewer years uh, than their South Korean counterparts. Uh, tuberculosis is very, very common. It's, it's a, a terrible, uh, infliction that most of the people, well, I can't say most, but a great number of people suffer, as well as STDs due to prostitution engaged by the women in order to make money. That's rather common around the train stations in some of the bigger cities. Um, roughly 20% of all the children are considered to be extremely malnourished. Uh, there are approximately 200,000 political prisoners and other so-called uh, uh, criminals that are housed in various camps throughout the country. And I'll get more into that a little bit later when we talk about the Korean caste system. 
North Korea is consistently at or near the bottom of all major indices regarding democracy, human rights, uh, economic opportunities, uh, political freedoms, uh, corruption, things of that nature. And as I mentioned before, the North Korean government is the, the Kim uh, dynasty. The founder, uh, Kim Il-sung, was appointed by the Russians in 1948. The Russians, by the way, uh, as you probably all remember, uh, were in control north of the 38th parallel, and they helped North Korea establish itself as a socialist government. So Kim Il-sung, the grandfather of the current leader, ruled from 1948 until 1994. He died and passed it off to his son, Kim Jong-il, who reigned from 1994 until 2011, when he passed it off to grandson of the founder, the son of Kim uh, Jong-il, the current leader, Kim Jong-un, uh, who has run the country since December of 2011. And just as an aside, I would point out that Kim Jong-un, although thought to be in his uh, early to mid thirties, we don't know exactly, is probably the most brutal of the three. He has thought to have uh, executed more than 80 people uh, in his rule, uh, nine plus years, more than his grandfather and father combined. He's a very brutal man. Uh, so having said all that, uh, is that a sufficient uh, introduction, Steve, or should we? Yeah, that's a wonderful capsule review, I think, <clears throat> of North Korea, which leads me to the next question, which is given all the world problems that the United States has to deal with and all the troubles and conflicts around the world, why is North Korea of such importance to us? You would think that a country of 25 million people with a, with, with a dynastic system which oppresses its people certainly unusual in some respects, but why is it so often at the center of US foreign policy? That's an outstanding question. And it's probably one of the more important ones that we'll deal with tonight, which brings me to our next slide after a brief introduction. North Korea possesses weapons of mass destruction. And when I use that term, weapons of mass destruction or WMD, most people these days think of nuclear devices, atomic, uh, or hydrogen bombs, things of that nature. But I want to point out that North Korea has a, a large supply of chemical weapons, and we know that they also have biological weapons. Uh, that figures into the equation, particularly when dealing uh, with South Korea. Um, so let's go to the missile slide, and I will point out some things. Uh, it's hard to see North Korea here. It's outlined in red. It should be clear enough, but very small. It's small so that you can see this is a flat presentation of a ball, which is why we have these wavy lines. They simply contour to the straight line distances uh, between North Korea and its intended targets. We see that it has some short range missiles here that will cover all of South Korea, uh, parts of Japan. We have medium range missiles that certainly cover all of Japan, including uh, the Northern Islands and they reach all the way down to Guam. That is significant. A few years back uh, when uh, Donald Trump sunk to the level of taunting Kim, when Kim was taunting him, Kim got fed up to the point and said, well, I will bracket uh, Guam with four of my intermediate range missiles, take that. And uh, that's probably one of the two times we came close to some sort of uh, conflict. It's not good uh, to start engaging in temper, temper tantrums with uh, Kim Il-sung or Kim Jong-un. So we have these intermediate range missiles that, that cover much of Eastern Asia. Then we have the major game changer. Uh, back in, uh, I believe, uh, November of uh, 2017, they launched a Hwasong-14 missile, that's the name of it, which has a range of 10,000 kilometers that's about 6,100 uh, miles. And you can see that its range includes all of Europe. That's why some of our allies in Europe are concerned about North Korea. Australia is concerned as well. Uh, it covers much of, but not all of the United States. But recently they've introduced the Hwasong 15 tests. 
And this is something else that changes the game. Its range is 13,000 kilometers. That is 8,100 miles. And recall, I asked you to remember that the distance from Korea to the West Coast and then on to Miami or Key West, 8,000 miles. This missile reaches all the way to Cuba. So now the North Koreans have the ability to throw uh, a payload perhaps as great as uh, 100 kilograms or 2,000 pounds, more than a ton, from North Korea to all parts of the United States. Now, there's something to be said about that. Uh, first of all, many of the people claim that some experts there deal with this on a daily basis. I'm not as much uh, involved as they are. I certainly pay attention to what they, they do, and I quote them when necessary, as I'm doing now. Uh, it's thought that perhaps the accuracy of the North Korean missiles is not as great as it could be. I would like to mention that should uh, they throw a missile in our direction, and let's say that they aim it at Los Angeles down here, or Washington DC here, or a little bit up the road, uh, the New York City area, those missiles could be off as much as 50 miles. And still, if they detonated, uh, would would instantly incinerate tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And perhaps up to the million would be affected by radiation poisoning. Uh, same thing for Seattle. You got Seattle, Bellevue, a lot of tech industries there. If they were to go for San Francisco, Oakland here, a lot of the tech industries are there. Uh, we would be hit, wounded pretty hard if a missile were to detonate anywhere near those areas. Others have brought out, and rightfully so, since the North Koreans have not tested a reentry vehicle, uh, maybe the missile won't detonate at all. Well, the explosive device that causes a missile or a, a warhead to uh, compress to the point that we have a nuclear chain reaction and the explosion, maybe it only fractures the uh, uranium containment and we scatter radioactive particles all over the area. We wouldn't have as many instantaneous deaths but it would certainly be a disaster as all these fine particles of several pounds of radioactive dust is spread throughout the area and carried by the wind, mostly from east to west. So even if the missile is inaccurate, we've got a problem. Even if the missile doesn't properly detonate, we've got a problem. The United States needs to pay attention to this. And unfortunately, they, uh, they're a little bit late to the game. They waited until the Hwasong 14 and the Hwasong 15 uh, came onto the scene before much concern was being evidenced. So, uh, let me ask another question, if I might, at this point. Um, sure. What is what is the size of North Korea's nuclear arsenal compared to that of, let's say, China or Russia, or the United States, for that matter? Um, do we have, I don't know if we have reliable. Do our intelligence people have reliable estimates on that? Do you think they're all over the? Uh, the map. Um, I don't have access anymore to classified information. I'm not sure that the classified information gives any better answer than the open sources that I'm going to be using tonight. Uh, we all know Sigrid Heckler, who was one of our negotiators, who's been in North Korea several times and has been able to visit some of the nuclear sites in North Korea. His estimate, best estimate, uh, is about 40 uh, nuclear devices. Range, uh, other estimates range from 20 or so all the way up into the hundreds. And a recent uh, estimate said by the year 2027, I don't know why they picked 2027, that's a kind of an odd number, but by 2027, it's estimated by one expert, they will have 200 uh, nuclear devices. That is not the critical factor though. Uh, the critical factor, however, is uh, their TELs, their transporter erector launchers. Those are the huge many axled trucks that these missiles are loaded on uh, to carry them over the roads, hill and dale, uh, which is an interesting uh, discussion in itself because North Korea is not going to put missiles in silos like the United States has. Uh, they put them on these trucks. They, some of the trucks are wheeled, which means they're stuck or reduced to only roads, but North Korea's road system, even though unpaved, uh, does traverse a great number of places, and North Korea itself has a number of caves, both natural and man-made, uh, 
these trucks can be hidden in these caves. Some of the missiles are liquid fueled, which means they would have to send a fuel truck out to, to load the fuel on. That's a laborious, time consuming process. Kind of defeats the idea of secrecy because every 90 minutes we have a satellite that passes overhead and we'd catch that. If, if we were in a conflict situation, the missile would soon be toast. But North Korea is moving from liquid fuels to solid fuels, and that means the missiles are already fueled. The fuel is cast into the missile as it's being built. It's a dangerous process. It's fraught with uh, uh, difficulty, but they've mastered it, at least in some cases. So they would be on these uh, vehicles that are wheeled and they could go about, pull out of the cave uh, on the transporter, lift up the uh, erector and launch probably within 15 minutes. Some of the vehicles are actually tracked, which means they could go off road. Uh, and that's something that, that's a game changer. But, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they're thought to have less than a dozen of these uh, transporter erector uh, launcher vehicles, some of which they got through China by saying to the people monitoring the sanctions that we're not getting uh, war material, these are lumber trucks. And that passed muster. So the, the initial eight came from China. They probably have a few developed locally, but that's the limiting factor right there. Uh, they have these, all of the other ones in for theater range uh, use the medium range and intermediate range, uh, less constriction on them. They would be able to be moved much more easily. But also I want to point out that just north of the DMZ, I should back up a little bit, just north of the DMZ, North Korea has thousands, I mean, literally thousands of artillery pieces and uh, short and medium range uh, missiles that are aimed at the South. Seoul, North, South Korea, let's, let's say, uh, has uh, roughly 50 million population. Half of that 25 million are within the Seoul metropolitan area, almost all the way up to the DMZ. It's like Southern California highways, houses, people. So you got 25 million people in this area here. Now you'd think it'd be easy for us to just uh, launch a boatload of our own missiles and take these guys out, but it's very difficult because they are built on the backsides of the mountains. That is on the, the northern face of the mountains, holes and artillery emplacements, caves have been dug into the mountains and the artillery pieces and missiles, rockets are housed in that uh, those caves and uh, revetments. When needed, they are backed out. They're already facing south, the, the launching tubes and the gun barrels. They're already facing south that they can be backed out of the hill, fired off, chugged back into the cave or revetment, whatever they are, to be reloaded. And unless we are Johnny on the spot, it would be difficult to get. Artillery shells can't do them. Uh, our missiles can't simply because our missiles, are, no missile that I know of, can go up north and make a U-turn to come back and get the north face of the mountain. So we have a difficulty there and that's what's allowed us, or rather allowed North Korea, despite the United States, to go ahead with its nuclear okay. uh, program right. and its missile program because mm -hmm. they've held uh, the Seoul area and the rest of the northern part of South Korea hostage. We can't attack because they will attack and probably get away with it. So, bit of difficulty there. Okay, all right, all right. I'm waving you on. Okay, um, oh, before we get to the, I'm sorry, Bob, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so before we get to the question of US policy, which we want to focus on, I'm just curious as to whether North Korea's achieved these technological uh, progress basically with homegrown technology or to what extent were they dependent upon friendly powers like the Soviet Union in the old days and China today? An interesting question. Much of their rocket technology originally came from uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, how they got there, we don't know. We do know though that since the uh, collapse of the uh, Soviet Union and the so-called end of the Cold War that uh, I, it's, it's kind of amusing because at the uh, one of the airports in Russia, uh, a lot of uh, nuclear and uh, rocketry scientists were captured 
uh, brought into custody, they were trying to leave the country, uh, presumably for North Korea to help Korea with its uh, missile programs and its nuclear technology. The, one nice of the issues, okay, pardon me. No, no, go ahead, please. I, I... Okay. Um, one of the issues that we have is that uh, the, shank, the sanctions regime that we've been uh, put into place by the United States unilaterally, as well as the United Nations multilaterally, uh, work only to some degree. Uh, it makes things difficult. That's a good thing because we don't want to make it easy for them, but they have been able to circumvent things. They've also had a lot of technical help and uh, educational guidance by a guy by the name of A.Q. Khan from uh, Pakistan down here uh, in this area. They have not done much on their own initially, but they have been able to build their latest missiles, the Hwasong-14, the Hwasong-15, um, pretty much on their own using existing technology. Uh, if you take a couple of, I think the nomenclature is RD-45 uh, rocket motors from the early uh, Scud engines, we talk about those being medium range, cluster them together, three of them, for example, uh, for symmetry, uh, and put a, a containment around it so that you have a cylinder rather than three separate uh, rocket engines. Uh, you can get a lot more thrust, and that's essentially what they've done but they've also learned very, very quickly on their own about a solid fuel technology. I'm sure they've had help. Uh, the Soviet Union, now Russia, uh, initially was loath to assist them with their nuclear technology, but now I think that uh, those uh, hes hesitancies have uh, somewhat evaporated because they, they can't have accomplished all of this without some sort of uh, material assistance. How they get their aluminum piping, for example, is something that has not been answered to my satisfaction. Yeah, thanks very much. I think it bears saying that the North Korean nuclear program has been going on for, for decades, literally. I mean, starting very small in, in the era when the Soviet Union was still in existence. And really, I think the first test, if I recall, nuclear test was in October 2006. So that's the fruit of what, 20 to 25 years of development, perhaps, is that right? Yes, that is true. And just to give you an idea of how well they've progressed, that was in October of 2006. The yield on that uh, ranges on that. Uh, people think it was kind of a failed test. The yield was half a kiloton to maybe two tons, depending on to whom you spoke. Uh, that's very paltry when one considers that uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were 15 and 20 uh, kilotons. So, but the second test uh, jumped it up to somewhere between two and four kilotons. By the way, a kiloton is a thousand pounds of TNT, the explosive equivalent. Uh, all the way up to, to September of 2017, uh, that was the latest bomb. That was in September, two months before the, uh, the Hwasong 14 test right here. Um, or the 15 test. That it was initially thought, we had estimates all over the place. Most experts think that it was somewhere now about 140 kilotons, but the more they look into things and evaluate uh, some of the uh, data that they've been able to collect, there are a few experts that claim that the yield might have been as much as 250 kilotons. That puts it into definitely the uh, thermonuclear range, hydrogen bomb range. It's clear that they have uh, some sort of uh, hydrogen bomb. That's a game changer. Yeah, okay, thanks. That's really interesting. And it's very impressive when you think of the poverty of the country as a whole and the backwardness of the society in general to think that, that by focusing on this program, the regime has been able to achieve something of that, of that caliber. Uh, let me interject a, a personal recollection here, if I might. In October 2006, I was actually in Beijing at a conference and I was invited to give a talk on US foreign policy. And someone asked me about the North Korean nuclear explosion, uh, which I ju just heard over the radio a few hours before. And I responded, they're never gonna give it up. This is just the beginning. Uh, I wish I had been wrong, but I, apparently I was not. Let, let's move now to the question of what threat does North Korea Pose to the security of the United States? Why should we be as concerned about it as we seem to be when there are so many other 
well, there are other nuclear powers in the world, which are, including Pakistan, which is not particularly friendly to us, by the way. It sort of blows hot and cold. But we seem to have a preoccupation or an obsession with North Korea in a way that we don't with other threats to our security. Well, that's true. Uh, the reason that the United States is concerned, in addition to uh, the threat posed by the United States to the United States by uh, North Korean missiles and uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, primarily North Korea is a destabilizer of the region. Uh, we have the Non-Proliferation Treaty. North Korea belonged to it, but they got into a snit and they bailed out of it, I think, in 2003. And uh, that was in January, I believe. Um, if North Korea is able to maintain a hold on its nuclear weapons, and it certainly looks that way, I concur with you, then the argument is, and I concur with this as well, both Japan and South Korea are going to be incentivized to develop their own weapons as a means of counter defense or, and, and counteracting that. The game no longer is uh, having enough weapons to prevent one from being attacked. Uh, the, the theory is now you need a second strike capability because if you use nuclear weapons and North Korea being a small country is going to be uh, incentivized to do theirs first because they're likely to go down if they don't, then they are going to have to endure a counter strike from the United States and its allies. So they are going to be focusing on a second strike capability. And eventually it's, it's an arms race. How do we conceal our missiles? How do we get enough missiles so that should we have a few wiped out or most of them wipe out, we can launch a counterattack uh, in retaliation. That's the concern because South Korea, uh, although it's a kind of a wavering ally at the moment due to uh, South Korean President Moon Jae-in's uh, political objectives, but certainly Japan, uh, our ally, are very much threatened by nuclear weapons of uh, North Korea. In fact, North Korea tested one of its missiles in an overflight of the Japanese island uh, Honshu, the main island there, overflew, landed here. That was a message to the Japanese for whom no Korean has a great deal of love, at least at the political level, not necessarily at the personal individual level. So we have this problem that this is a destabilizing, destabilizing factor in the, uh, in the region. Now, a counterforce to that is the United States, uh, you might recall, withdrew its uh, nuclear uh, missiles and, and weapons from South Korea where they had been for some time in 1991. <clears throat> that was George Bush's uh, the junior uh, decision to do that out, to pull them out. So we have a nuclear-free South Korea, but at the same time, we extended the United States nuclear umbrella to cover both Japan and South Korea. So in a sense, uh, both J South Korea and Japan today are under our uh, protection, nuclear protection. And under normal circumstances, that might be considered adequate. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, when Donald Trump was pulling back from all of our alliances and uh, saying it's America first and to heck with everybody else, the value of that nuclear umbrella uh, is probably under question now in both Japan and South Korea. So the question is, now that we have uh, President Joe Biden in and he's working to get uh, America's alliances in Asia uh, back on a, a stable track, is our nuclear umbrella uh, still valid? Does, do people have faith in it? Uh, will they trust it enough to not uh, develop their own weapons? I can't speak to South Korea. I knew that, I know that at one point uh, the original uh, Pak Chung Yi. Uh, the, the dictatorial president of South Korea after uh, Syngman Rhee ordered his people to develop a nuclear arsenal. I don't think they got very far. I think they called it quits after a while. But the Japanese during World War II were very close to developing their own set of nuclear weapons. <clears throat> I wrote a paper on that uh, several years ago. And in doing the research for that paper, I learned that Japan has several thousand pounds of highly enriched uranium and or plutonium in stock 
on their islands. Uh, their technology is such that uh, they could probably develop a bomb and have it ready for uh, deployment within six to nine months. So we have a serious problem. Uh, we don't want nuclear uh, proliferation, uh, yet we have a, a country that has broken out of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and has the bomb. So we've got a problem there to deal with. Indeed, indeed we do, I think. But let me ask another question here, and that is the countries that do possess nuclear weapons basically say that they have them to deter assaults from, from other nuclear powers. So if deterrence works for the United States in order to deter, let's say, in the, during the Cold War, a Soviet threat or a Russian threat too, since the Russians still have a substantial number of nuclear weapons, why is deterrence something that's good for us, but not for anybody else, including our foes? <laughs> um, it's a matter of whom we're dealing with. We, uh, it took us a while, but we finally developed a, a sense of detente with the Soviet Union. And after China developed its bomb, it took us a few years, but we finally developed a detente with them. We need to do the same with North Korea. The, the theory of mutually assured destruction, that was the operating theory uh, back during the Cold War, right. uh, it, it doesn't hold anymore with, with uh, South Korea or uh, North Korea. We do have other nuclear players, Pakistan and India. They seem to be at loggerheads all the time, but they don't get along well. Um, I don't think they uh, pose any threat to other than each other. There's Israel, of course, uh, that is a purely defensive measure with regard to uh, their neighbors that are sometimes hostile. And then there's, there's France and the uh, United Kingdom, our allies. But with regard to North Korea, we need to get inside their minds and understand uh, the way they think. And contrary to what H.R. McMaster, uh, President Trump's first uh, national security advisor said, uh, Kim Jong-un is not a little crazy. He's not weirded out. He's not a fat little boy that uh, we can't understand. It's it's makes good press for the journalists to say that North Korea is the unknowable country, but that I maintain is absolutely not true. We know as much about North Korea as we need to know to effectively deal with them. Uh, the fact that they're a closed society, they don't let much information out, and they don't let hardly any information in is no different than uh, the lack of intelligence, intelligence we had uh, on Japan uh, during the war years. We didn't have operatives in Japan to give us much information. We have the same problem today, but we have more sources, overhead satellites. We have a lot more reconnaissance going in, uh, in and around uh, the area. So we know enough to do the things that we need to do. Uh, what we don't know is what drives Kim. I think we do, uh, but it doesn't seem to be uh, taken seriously. And that's probably another question that you'll be asking a little bit later. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a very important point that you made. And I think the historical analogy in terms of what we do know and do not know at, at any given time about our potential adversaries is a very important one. So in a sense, although we live in an information age now, there are still ways in which you can conceal information and the internal processes within any government, including our own for that matter, when people are not shooting their mouths off all the time, which did happen particularly during the Trump administration because of the problems that were implicit in that, in that situation. Uh, one never really knows um, what's going on in the mind of, of a Putin, for example. I know that at one point, George W. Bush, when he was president, looked into the eyes of Putin and saw his soul. Well, um, you know, if you can fantasize things that aren't there, then you're in trouble in terms of trying to decipher the thinking of potential adversaries. W one more question before I move on to an another set. And that is, what is North Korea's declared nuclear policy? Does it have one that it's stated explicitly? Or are we guessing? Well, we know that it's a it's part now of their uh, constitution. They are uh, a self-declared nuclear power, whether the United States 
the carers to admit that and, and deal with it effectively or not. It's part of their constitution. Uh, Kim Jong-un regularly refers to as uh, well as uh, all of his spokespeople to a person, uh, refer to their nuclear weapons as their treasured uh, sword. This mm -hmm. is their, their means of defense. It's their means of, of retribution. It's the way to keep the great Satan, to use a, um, another country's term for us, at bay. And so far, it's worked. So, but in terms of first strike or second strike, they don't say anything like that. I mean, I know that there are a number of countries that's, that have foresworn that they will not be the first to employ nuclear weapons and they will use it in conflict only if they themselves are attacked first with nuclear weapons. Well, but North Korea is, has not said anything like that. To my knowledge, such a policy has not been codified. I do know that Kim Jong-un has said a couple of times that they do not intend to use it first. But the question then becomes, can we take Kim at his word? I would maintain that, uh, let me build a scenario that actually happened here. And we're very fortunate that uh, things kind of settled down. At one point in 2017, Donald Trump <clears throat> was so upset with Kim Jong-un after their uh, war of words about who's got the bigger button and what psychological meaning one can take from that. He sent, Trump sent three US carrier task forces uh, to the waters just off North Korea. It was the USS Nimitz, the USS Ronald Reagan, and the USS uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Now each US carrier group has a great number of support ships uh, that are not merely support, but they're also warships in their own mind, in their own way, uh, cruisers, uh, corvettes, uh, destroyers, and the like. They all have firepower. But the, the thing that scares Kim the most was the 85 or so aircraft uh, that each carrier contained. So we had a, a, the equivalent of the Spanish Armada camped off of uh, mm. North Korea. That should have scared the bejesus out of for Kim Jong-un. To add to that, we had nuclear capable B-1 bombers flying by, as well as some of the more advanced fighters uh, from the South Korea station there uh, joining up in the air overhead. This was all joined by warships from Japan. Were I in Kim Jong-un's shoes observing all this, my thought would be, those guys are getting ready to attack. They're massed their forces just off my door, they're going to attack. I'm going down. Oh, no, I'm not, not without a fight. Press the buttons, buddy. And we have North Korean nuclear weapons going somewhere, probably Japan, South Korea. Uh, 2017, they didn't have uh, their latest nuclear test or their uh, greatest missiles, but they certainly had the ability to throw what warheads they had uh, into Japan and South Korea. That would have started something serious. Uh, the war of words that Trump engaged with, uh, Kim Jong-un with, uh, and his uh, bluster by forcing or sending those forces off the North Korean coast, I think was um, very much too much. It was, it, things could have very easily gone in a different direction. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. I mean, what suggests is that despite the common assumption often that Kim Jong-un is irrational, crazy. I realize that no. I haven't finished answering your question. Oh, so I'm sorry. Things, uh, I implied, uh, let, I'll state it specifically. It's my contention that if North Korea were faced with what it feels is an, an imminent attack from the United States or uh, with the blessings by an ally of the United States, it would be inclined to use its nuclear weapons because it's a case of either use them or lose them. If they don't do it first before we carpet bomb the country uh, into a, being a level parking lot, they would have no chance of retaliation. And I am, uh, my studied opinion on this is that uh, Kim is not the kind of guy to take things lying down. He would not go down without a fight. He wants a bloody nose at the very, very least. Okay, 
Um, everything you say inspires another question in me. <laughs> Too many questions, <laughs> but I have one more now. I guess that's the nature of a dialogue, so it's working, I guess. I suppose. Um, yeah, well, okay. Uh, well, okay, well, actually, let, let, me, let me move on to the, the next set of questions rather than, I'll, I'll save the one that I had in mind for another time. Okay. Um, other communist countries, I, I mean, I know that I accept your definition that North Korea is no longer a communist country. It's, it's a dynastic, it's a Kim dynasty, sort of old style in a sense in, in new clothing. Um, but uh, other communist countries like China and then Russia would, after the Soviet Union, changed their economies and opened up, e even Cuba, still a communist country, has introduced market mechanisms. Um, China is certainly as a communist country still ha has partially capitalist economy in it. What, if anything, has North Korea done to adjust its economy to open it up to the outside world so that its population can have a better life and therefore maybe support the regime more than perhaps they do? What's, the, what's the hang up there, if you will? Okay. Um, there are a number of questions and a number of aspects uh, of your question that need to be addressed. Number one is uh, we need to start with the definition of what a command economy is. A command economy, one that uh, the North Koreans have, is one in which the state controls what is produced, how and when it's produced, and then who gets uh, whatever it was that was produced. Uh, Kim controls that mightily. Uh, it's not the capitalistic supply and demand uh, invisible hand that Adam Smith talked about. Kim is unwilling to endure that because it lessens his control. And the reason that he cannot afford to engage in the capitalistic aspects, uh, such as uh, China has modernized Cuba, certainly, and to a somewhat uh, other communist countries, he cannot afford to give up that level of control. Even though the public distribution system, which is supposed to take care of all North Korean citizens' basic needs, food, uh, clothing, and that, and all their houses, housing is uh, provided for free, uh, Kim must maintain the illusion of control over that, even though it's inadequate. Now, there in the past, uh, well, toward the beginning of his reign, he loosened up a little bit and allowed some mom and pop style uh, capitalistic endeavors. People that had some uh, vegetables or grains left over after meeting their state imposed uh, production quotas were allowed to take those to market, set up a stall, and sell them and, and keep. Uh, as much money as they could hire from the authorities who would come for shakedowns or so-called fields. Fees, uh, you have a market here on the street, you need to pay a street fee. fee. Oh, you're, you're dumping your garbage in the gutter, you need to pay a garbage fee. And oh, by the way, my son is uh, quite getting ready to have a baby, uh, we need a, a, a birthing gift, and what do you got for us? Those sorts of things. Kim is willing to endure these low-level, small-scale capitalistic endeavors uh, to allow the people to supplement the, the inadequate public distribution system. It's a sop. It's a way to put a Band-Aid on a larger wound. It gives people a, a, a sense of hope in one way. And there have been some, a few very successful uh, entrepreneurs in this that have amassed a great deal of money and on a number of occasions have gone in together to loan money to engage in larger projects such as building, uh, uh, erecting buildings, uh, things of that nature, starting larger things like uh, public transportation of you need a package delivered to your mother out in the country, we'll do that for you. Those sorts of things. But Kim is not about to give up uh, his control of the economy uh, to capitalistic uh, theories. And the reason that he can get away with that, the reason he does it rather, is because he really doesn't care about his uh, average citizens. What he is uh, bound in his own mind to do is preserve the country, meaning his regime, by any means possible. That is taken to mean developing weapons of mass destruction and the means to deliver them to ensure his life. 
and the life of the elites whose loyalty he has purchased with uh, those illegal luxury goods. He has to provide the basic, uh, a minimum subsistence level uh, to his people. And he does that, but it's very much a subsistence level. As I mentioned earlier, uh, perhaps as much as 20% or more of children are thought to be severely malnourished. Uh, people don't get treatment for uh, tuberculosis, uh, STDs, uh, they don't get well treated. Uh, there have been reports of people going to hospitals and they have to find money to buy their own anesthesia or bring in their own uh, food and blankets, things of this nature. Kim does not do a very good job of taking care of the average citizen uh, because he, he doesn't care for them. Okay, but uh, presumably though, there are enough people in the elite, in the Korean Workers' Party, in the bureaucracy and the army who are, who, who are given a sufficient means of living to, be, to extend their loyalty to the, to the Kim dynasty. So if the mass of the population is only at subsistence level, there is at least some percentage of it, which is bought off, to use that term loosely, by goods that the, that the regime distributes to them, which is standard in, communi in communist countries too, by the way. There are always people who are better off than the vast majority of people. And those were the ones who were in the party or in the, in the bureaucracy or in, in the military, mm -hmm. so that you could secure yourself by taking the limited goods and spreading them out only to those who you really favor and whose support you needed. Is that more or less the way it works in North Korea? Pretty much. Uh, let me back up a little bit and <clears throat> start out uh, from a slightly different point, and then I will get really quickly back to the, uh, the question that you've answered. Uh, we have this thing, North Korea has this thing called a uh, songbun. It is a caste system. And people are divided into three categories of trustworthy, wavering, and uh, unfriendly enemies. Kim Il-sung, the founding father, estimated at the time that perhaps 25% of the population was trustworthy. 55% uh, were wavering and therefore not of much value to the, the regime. And then there's 20% left that were actually hostile. Uh, this rating affects how you live in North Korea. Uh, moreover, it, your determination as to what category of person or what category into which you fall is determined by the past behavior, perhaps as far back as three generations of your direct antecedents and your immediate family members, as well as the behavior of your extended family relatives. And once you get placed, once you have been placed or your ancestors, have been placed in one of these categories, it's next to impossible to get out of it. Being in one of these categories uh, affects what type of a job you will get, whether or not you can become a member of the Workers' Party of Korea, which is the gateway to, uh, I wouldn't say prosperity, but at least an easier life. It's also a way to get better health care, such as it is. As it is. Uh, without being a member of the uh, Workers Party of Korea, you're pretty much doomed to the lower levels of existence in Korea. By the way, out of a population of maybe 25 million people, only, uh, let me check my notes here. I'm not sure of yeah. that. Yeah, Bob, I wanna move on to another subject actually, which is okay. one of the- Okay, well, I mean, one quick question, one yeah. quick question, and that is the elites are thought to number Two to 3,000 people, and they go back by blood and uh, uh, friendship to uh, Kim Il sung, the founder's fellow guerrillas in fighting the Japanese. And if you are a member of that group, then uh, your ancestors, your, your de descendants, uh, have a chance to become one of the elites. And so that's another hereditary feature of the system. Okay, let's move to the question of US policy. It's and Steve, if I might just interject, I know this yeah. is a great conversation. We are getting to eight o'clock and I wonder yeah. if we could, um, yeah. we may run over a bit, but I'd like to go to some audience questions perhaps after you posed your last question. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, sorry, Dina, I've been take, carried away by the interest <laughs> of the discussion here. Um, US policy, what's wrong? Why doesn't it work? It hasn't worked for a long time. The goals haven't changed. What can we do? 
to change that so that we can, what is, what is a reasonable, feasible policy for the United States to have vis-a-vis -vis North Korea? Is the notion of complete denuclearization of North Korea feasible or is it just pie in the sky? My thought is it's pie in the sky and that uh, when in private conversations, the subject comes up, even our diplomats probably recognize this. Uh, I'm gonna give you two quotes. Uh, first from a James Clapper, who's former director of national intelligence uh, back in 2016, uh, that was October. Uh, he said that it's probably a lost cause. That's a direct quote, probably a lost cause. When we have the top intelligence official in the United States making such a statement, it pretty much tells me that it's a lost cause. Furthermore, in January of this year, Sidney Saylor, who is top national intelligence officer uh, on North Korea, has stated that, and I'm going to quote here, every engagement by Pyongyang, that is, in diplomacy has been designed to further the nuclear program, not to find a way out, that is, to find a way to denuclearize. Mm -hmm. So once again, we have an intelligence person who has access to more information than our diplomats by far. They're saying that it's not possible. I would say we need to understand uh, th this is why we talk about strategic empathy. We need to look at things through the eyes of Kim, and we don't do that. What would be Kim's motivation to give up uh, his cushy position at the top of a country? He regularly thumbs his nose at the United States and gets away with it. He has the singular distinction of frustrating the mightiest power on the face of the earth in history, and he gets away with it. He has every physical pleasure that he wants, every. He's got the fealty of his elites that he buys, but nonetheless, he's got people at his beck and call. Uh, he's a very insecure guy. Dictators at the top of the pile run a lonely life, but why would he give that up? Absolute power is an addiction, and uh, I don't think that he has any motivation to give that up. So given, uh... Assuming that what you say is true, and it certainly sounds true to me, what, what, do you, what should be the U.S. policy? Is, can we come to terms with the existence of a nuclear North Korea and work out a deal in the same way that we have come to came to terms with a nuclear Soviet Union, which is hostile to us, right? and a nuclear, a nuclear power China as well, which is a hostile power? Um, well, you, what, what, is hold, what is holding us back, if anything, except perhaps our own arrogance from not pursuing a policy of North Korea that would work? I'm not sure what the, the, the rationale behind our refusal uh, to deal with North Korea cut some sort of uh, uh, modus vivendi, some sort of detente with them, other than, uh, well, I don't want to go there. Uh, our State Department officials are highly educated. Uh, they're very intelligent people. They've gone to the right schools. Uh, they cycle in and out of government. They've got uh, a great deal of experience, both uh, in government and diplomatic circles, as well as in think tanks where they've met and uh, associated with others. Uh, they certainly cross-pollinate, and despite whatever political stripe, whether they're a hardliner or a, an idealist, it seems to me that they probably, in their heart of hearts realize that North Korea is indeed a lost cause, that they're not going to give it up, uh, that there's no motivation. So why don't we negotiate a detente or some mode of dealing with North Korea? I think it's a matter of time. But then we have Joe Biden and his uh, recycled people from the Obama administration running the State Department, making statements like, well, our goal remains the complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. And what they've done is they've changed the word denuclearization to dismantlement. And then the G7 put out a statement saying that they changed the word dismantlement to abandonment. Well, that's just lipstick on the same old pig. Uh, North Korea is not going to go for that. We learned that at the Hanoi conference in 2019 uh, between Kim and Trump. Trump wanted you give them up all and we'll release the sanctions. Kim said, no, 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 you release all the sanctions first. And they couldn't come to definitions of yeah. what uh, facilities would be given up 
and what sanctions would be raised, the whole thing fell apart. So it seems to me, and let's wrap it up here so we can get to questions from people watching, that there's a kind of paradox in a sense that we say that North Korea is an imminent threat to our security, very dangerous, it has to be taken very seriously, and yet our government, whether it's run by the Democrats or Republicans, do not seem to pursue a policy that would actually engage North Korea in the kind of dialogue that might result in a lessening of tensions. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, we're saying one thing, but we're doing things that are contrary to the achievement of a reasonable objective, which as you said repeatedly, complete verifiable nuclear denuclearization, denuclearization is infeasible. So I think that's uh, the message that I get from what you're saying and the lack of strategic empathy, in other words, putting ourselves in their shoes is a problem that we have to manage ourselves before we can make any progress with them. Is that a fair, fair, fair way to sum it up? I would say so, yes. Okay, and until our next hamburger at uh, Mary, <laughs> at, at Glenn's I'll Cafe. Yeah, okay, buy. <laughs> you're buying, thank you. Okay, Dino, let's get in some questions from the audience here. And I'm sorry that I took so much time, but when I get together with Bob, the time passes. And whether he's paying or me, I don't, don't know what time it is anymore, so. Well, it sounds like we should have sent both of you a slice of pie and a burger. Um, I think you've addressed many of the questions of the audience, um, and certainly for those we don't get to tonight, be assured that we will be sharing these questions um, with our speakers. We have just launched a new blog on the Mansfield Center website, and the first blog post uh, was by Bob McCoy, so I would encourage you all to go there, provide your feedback, and perhaps his, our next post could be his responses to your questions. But I think just to wrap it up, I'd like to, to pose a couple of the questions that we have from the audience, turning it away from nuclear weapons and looking at other kinds of warfare, biological and cyber warfare. So I'm going to read both of these questions. Um, one is from Caitlin. When the threat of North Korea is discussed, it usually focuses on their nuclear capability. Given that we know that North Korea has biological weapons, has the COVID-19 pandemic and its global impact shifted what the US views as the major threat? The second question from Miriam uh, references a recent double issue of the New Yorker in which there's a lengthy article um, titled Rocket Men, subtitled How North Korean Hackers Fund Their, their Country's Weapons Program through cybercrime. Uh, so, could you comment on uh, both the, the threats of cybercrime and biological weapons? Yes, um, I will attack the first one first biological weapons. Um, did we lose contact or something? Can I'm sorry? I, did we lose contact? Okay, no, we hear you. Okay, we're, we're still good. Um, North Korea does possess, as I mentioned earlier, a sizable both chemical and biological uh, inventory. And in the past, uh, they have been sending drones uh, from North Korea for two reasons over South Korea. One, to map out uh, routes of attack. And it became apparent at the same time that these small drones could also be used uh, as attack weapons. A drone could carry a five-pound uh, load quite easily. They're, they're big enough to carry a five-pound load. And if five pounds of sarin or something of that nature were dropped uh, during rush hour in downtown Seoul or Tagu or Pusan, uh, those that didn't suffer horrible deaths or become sick and incapacitated to overload medical facilities, uh, in addition to that, there would be widespread panic and it would just disrupt any type of response that South Korea uh, might be able of mounting due to those uh, uh, issues. Now, I don't think that the biological, rather, yeah, the biological things uh, can withstand the heat of re-entry, uh, although they're probably working on that. I don't think the United States has as much concern about that as, uh, the, the nuclear weapons. Although <clears throat> I have to say that if five pounds of sarin or some similar uh, chemical were dropped on uh, the Washington DC environs or the greater New York metro area or greater Los Angeles area, 
it would have the same effect. It would be a deadly, deadly blow to the United States. We should pay attention to that. You're absolutely right. Uh, many times I did get caught up in the latest nuclear developments, but I did write a paper about the biological warfare uh, some years ago in which I did address this. It's something that we need to maintain awareness of and prepare for. In fact, our military people stationed in South Korea do have hazmat suits to protect them from both the chemical and biological uh, warfare agents. Our civilians, they're a lost cause, I'm afraid to, to announce. With regard to the hacking, the North Koreans have one of the most sophisticated and massive hacking forces um, I've ever discussed or uh, learned about. I would say that they're just as good as the Russians, which by the way, shut down our Eastern United States uh, pipeline rather effectively, you'll recall. And the North Koreans have been able to extract money from things. They hijacked close to a million dollars some years ago from a bank in the Philippines. Um, they are always looking for ways to do that. And they are, they're quite sophisticated, they're successful. So yes, we need to be uh, aware of this and, and do a better job of fighting the cyber war. Great, well, I wanna thank you both. This has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, clearly the two of you have uh, bantered these issues back and forth many times over the years. Um, so. I'm sorry. We have fun. <laughs> so I, I don't know if either one of you would like to make a closing statement before we wrap up for this evening. Um, I've said pretty much what I intended to say. Steve might have a few words. I just want to thank uh, the audience for uh, listening to us and you, Dina, the Mansfield Center for uh, hosting us. It's, it's been a very enjoyable experience for me. Yeah, well, for me as well, an educational experience too. I mean, Many of the questions I asked you, I hadn't thought of until you began speaking, which is the nature of a dialogue, a genuine dialogue. And I applaud that the Mansfield Center is hosting these kinds of dialogues. And I assume that in the fall, um, it will resume. I think this is the last dialogue of the spring semester. But I think the, the new blog that Dina Mansour just mentioned is going to be a forum in which ideas on various subjects not only Korea and East Asia for that matter, but also ethics and public policy and a whole range of issues can be discussed. So we encourage you as Dina did a moment ago to read the blog and contribute comments to it and let's get discussions going. That's, that's the way a democracy should work. So thank you everyone for attending and good night. Absolutely. And I do want to say thanks to you both again, and also that Steve Levine is the moderator for that blog. So any comments or submissions would go directly to him. Um, so thank you both again for speaking tonight. And thanks to our audience for joining us. Good night. Good night. Good night.